for, for giving us this opportunity. <laughs> So thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to discuss Finn and my paper, Multispecies Entanglements in the Virus Sphere. Um, both uh, Finn would later introduce himself, but both of us, uh, we're here situated in Zurich at the University of Zurich, the Institute of Asian and Oriental Studies. Uh, here in uh, Switzerland. Uh, I'm an anthropologist by training, social cultural anthropology, uh, with uh, the focus of research is in Japan. And now currently my new project is on aging in Japan and the use of uh, robotic devices in the framework of care. So it was first, I was looking at uh, robotic devices in uh, including also those that um, uh, support caregivers uh, in, in different functions functionalities in say like lifting uh, elderly in and out of the bed or the bathtub and whatnot. Uh, but um, then I came across more and more of communication robots as a social robots. And this is now my focus of uh, research because to use Cheryl Turkle's um, a terminology of a second nature that we're introducing in the midst of care. What does that mean? And in what way will it change the dynamics of uh, care? Because soon in Japan, we will have a gap of 400,000 care workers, uh, too few. Uh, and, and, uh, and you have a, a big number of, of, of elderly, which is rapidly increasing. And they have very restrictive immigration laws. And despite the new revised um, immigration law from 2000. 19, it will be not enough. So that's why these uh, robotic uh, devices are becoming prevalent, not only in Japan, but also here in Europe, especially in the Nordic countries, uh, such as in Denmark. Good. So this about my own uh, background. Um, and uh, so Finn and I, we decided to write this paper because originally we were trying to organize an international workshop entitled Toward an Understanding of Non-Human Minds from, artificial, from Animal to Artificial uh, agency and this was supposed to take place in June this year and as people were we were organizing everything and as people um, were booking their flights the the, the, the pandemic um, was uh, hit and um, and eventually we had to um, nobody knew what to do in the beginning and and then at some point we we, we had to um, uh, cancel it and we were thinking about in what way uh, the virus might have had an agency in having to cancel this uh, the, 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 the workshop. So this was um, um, a paper that we're writing right now with the submissions for the uh, conference papers. We got nine papers. Um, uh, one uh, focuses on Lyme disease and the way in which the patients personify Lyme disease. So as if Borrelia had a certain level of life. And then another paper uh, looks at um, witchcraft and spirits in, um, uh, in Haiti. Uh, and uh, another one talks about human camel relationships in Somaliland. And uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to, we're, we're, um, basically agency is, is, is an important topic for us. So um, whether the virus might have some level of agency is a paper that Finn and I are now planning to write as the introductory chapter for the special issue of this workshop conference. And basically the conference, uh, just to give you a very, um, within a minute, I can quickly explain the content. So in the pre-modern world, animistic societies believed that not only humans, but also non-human beings were able to express agency. Agency is defined here as the ability to initially shape one's own surroundings at the both conscious and subconscious level. Uh, however, scholars in the Judeo-Christian tradition have long relegated claims of non-human agency to the sphere of misguided anthropomorphism, recognizing only humans as having the ability to transform ideas into actions. And in the 21st century, these long-held beliefs have come under renewed scrutiny. Recent uh, scholarship acknowledges that non-human animals are not merely passive objects or prompts of human actions. Rather, growing evidence shows that they not only react to humans, but also help shape human history through their subconscious actions. 
And uh, within Japan, also the three organizers of this conference is Finn, Melissa, and myself. We are all focusing in our own research on uh, Japan. Finn as a historian, Melissa in liter literature, and myself in anthropology. Um, so for in terms of my work, I'm trying to understand the higher acceptance of robots in Japan. And, and there is a level of uh, the, 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 maybe the Buddhist framework, but also animism that plays a role. So our main questions were, how does the introduction of non-human agents affect our understanding of the nature culture divide? What measures can be employed to prevent anthropomorphizing non-human agents? And lastly, what ethical and social issues emerge? when humans are decentered as the predominant reference of agency. So this was the, uh, the, the workshop, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the conference, and now we were able to move uh, the workshop uh, as Zoom discussions online, which happened a few weeks ago, and we're hoping to have a special issue uh, come out uh, with the nine paper submissions uh, that uh, we received. Yeah, and I would follow up um, shortly also introducing myself and then giving a bit more context on the paper you have read here uh, for today. So as Anne said, I'm a historian, uh, more concretely an environmental historian. I have made my PhD about whales and dolphins in Japan, looking at how um, certain Japanese societies in pre-modern times have believed that whales were gods who were bringing uh, fish towards the shore and because of this, it was not allowed to hunt whales in these regions. And uh, as you may know, most uh, people believe that Japanese have always hunted whales, and I show that certain regions did not do that. So this was my topic for my uh, PhD. And um, I also came from this um, perspective of the interrelation between uh, humans and whales and how they interact. And this was also uh, my original idea why uh, I proposed to Anne and Melissa this conference. And as Anne has said, um, we got off topic a little bit uh, with the pandemic. And uh, we began to really invest a lot of time to really understand what was happening right now in this current world situation. And as East Asian specialists, both of Japan, not of China, but nevertheless, we felt a bit closer to the origins of this virus and how people perceive it there. And so we did write back in March a draft paper. Uh, I think it was, it was about 10,000 words about everything we have experienced. We really read into the uh, literature of um, what um, Chinese scientists have um, discovered about coronaviruses, especially in 2002 when with the first coronavirus outbreak at the SARS. And we soon realized that there was more than one topic that um, we wanted to talk about. So one was about the agency and we have put this to the um, special issue. And then was the other topic that emerged out of this and this is these multi-special entanglements and how the Anthropocene, a topic I also wrote about in my PhD, is maybe connected to this and this is this the more we read about the topic, the more we saw this is an own topic that merits its own discussion. So uh, we, just, we uh, separated these two papers to the one you have now read today, and in which we argue possibly that um, the Anthropocene will bring forward more pandemics like this as the multi-special entanglements, especially if we look at the viruses, are more and more converging and we see more of the spillover effects. That being said, we are not biologists. We have consulted some biologists in earlier versions of this paper draft. We are not Chinese experts. We have consulted Chinese experts on earlier versions of this draft, but there's still a lot for us to learn and we really like the expertise. Um, uh, I, we hope that this um, Zoom meeting can provide us. So we are open to suggestions of how to improve the paper and of honest feedback. So thank you both for offering the, the paper. And I, I just wanted to zoom in um, on a line that's super important in the paper. Um, you know, the idea of virus here is in the title. And you've got a sentence saying, it's now accepted that viruses by far are the most abundant organic entities we know of, probably even more common than all other life forms combined. I mean, that's a huge sentence. And um, 
I just invite you to kind of slow down with that and, and unravel what that might mean for multi-species studies or, um, you know, kind of what, what are the broad implications of, of that sentence for rethinking some, some of the fundamental um, relationships among life on Earth? Um, well, I think it is a really important um, sentence and we of course took it out of the literature so we haven't <laughs> done any research on it by ourselves. But I think it really shows of how much um, we as human beings only think of things we can see and we experience in our everyday life and we forget that there's so much more beneath the visible world and especially even below uh, the bacterial world, there is a whole sphere which uh, has its own rules, its own interactions, and it sometimes comes up to us. We often see it as diseases or harm towards us, but there is much more than that. And the notion of the virus sphere, so uh, a whole world we cannot see, but still is there and fundamentally changes not only human experience, but the whole biosphere and how everything works and interconnects with each other was really intriguing for us. And uh, we have recently also read um, the paper, which was, I think, also discussed here, virus, viruses as living processes, and Stefan Gutting is here as well. So his notions of the virome was also very interesting to us. And we are still trying to find a middle ground between the virusphere as the place where the, the viral cloud interacts with all its hosts and the specific virums of a single, well, single individual, individual is, individual is wrong, so of a being where all the viruses sit inside the body of someone and are essentially part of this body. And we have to come to get away from this idea of concrete singular entities that stand side by side, but uh, much more, we are all interconnected much more than we have ever believed a few years back. Yes, and to add what Finn was just saying is that the virus is not only, as we understand it, not, not always an enemy because like it would be surprisingly that we are still uh, alive because apparently 8% of the human uh, genome is uh, partially viral and then we read that for instance, syncytine, for instance, codes for a protein made in the placenta that allows the fetus to draw nutrients from its mother. And it's a viral gene indicating viral infection enabled the evolutionary emergence of mammals. And, and, um, so, and this shows that the human is really a part virus as well. And this is one of the reasons to care about viruses uh, and not always viruses against us um, and, and apparently there is more than eight percent it could um, if you if you look at the ERVs the endogenous uh, retroviruses it has it seems that there is this that part of the human genome is even more viral than we assume it is so there is still much that uh, we, we we don't know yet upwards of 50 percent I mean that's you know yeah. And it's it's interesting, you know. This is this is kind of old news for genomic scientists. You know, when when the the human genome was sequenced twenty years ago, like that was one of the findings is that you know there's all this viral DNA in us. Um, but but back on your paper, I I think um, you know as as I'm understanding it, the virus sphere is kind of like biosphere, like at least in the conventional literature, like. And, and Sasha could comment on, on this too, like how, how that term is applied in, in the primary biological literature. But here, my sense is that you're trying to do something different. You're, you're trying to introduce this idea of the anthroposphere and um, sort of distinct virus spheres. Um, so maybe if you could say more about how, how you're trying to kind of take conventional definitions of, of the virus sphere and push them towards something else. Uh, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. We are trying to do something a bit different with the virusphere. Um, so in the biological literature, as we understand it, it's very broad definition of, um, well, every virus and hosts organism um, interacting with each other. And we are coming, we want, we wanted to make a bit more of distinctions saying that uh, the virusphere is not uniform as as the same as human presence on this planet, planet is also not uniform. So we have certain um, ec ecological systems, ecosystems, in which 
um, certain processes, certain species, or certain, well, if you want to define uh, viruses as living processes, processes are more prevalent than in others. So the, our idea of the virus fair is that um, certain, certain human populations, for instance, have certain viral clouds inside them which they um, give to each other. And when they come in contact with uh, populations which does not have the same, the same viral clouds, they may interact with each other and um, change um, um, the, the viral clouds of each other. And this gets really interesting if we look at multi-species entanglement, because it's not only between humans, but also between different kinds of um, non-human animals, for instance. And um, apparently, from what we got, gathered from the literature, these so-called spillovers are not very, most viruses do not that often have spillovers with other um, animals, but between animals. Uh, because of the species boundary, but in the case of the SARS coronaviruses, it seems that these spillovers happen quite often. And this is something we saw in these Chinese markets. And so this is the reason why we wanted to have a closer look at them of how um, the specific virus sphere there developed between the different species. Sasha, do you have any thoughts on, on you know, first, if, if you could just like, so am I understanding the conventional ideas of the virus here? It's, it's basically like all the viruses on, on the planet. Is that sort of how it's, it's thought of? Uh, yeah, I agree. So it's, it's a, a virus where it is basically a diversity of all viruses uh, at this globe. So it's, it's uh, the, the whole diversity. So simply just describing that what we actually don't know. And we roam, it is, uh, yeah, it is um, ecologically restricted uh, and uh, entangled uh, with host something entity. So it's ecosystem, basically. So it could be ecosystem, just a single human. It could be uh, uh, larger or you could even could uh, say uh, Virom, it is about organ, uh, some, for instance. Um, uh, so this is very interesting uh, what you're trying to, um, in your research, uh, uh, so to, to bring uh, basically Virom and Virosphere. So, uh, because it's uh, also there are bridges, of course. Uh, and, uh, and because uh, human population, uh, it is also in a way discontinuous and continuous. So, because we, we live in a restricted area, but, uh, uh, but because we interact uh, between humans and move, and also between different species, so that, uh, constantly there are con uh, contacts and uh, uh, exchange. And market probably it is one of focal area where you could see this, uh, this forcefully basically bring, bring uh, about, and uh, exchanges could happen more profoundly. Yeah, but viruses are different um, uh, fundamentally in terms that some of them uh, could jump and some uh, may not. So, yeah, so there are viruses, virus groups which um, evolve uh, a very, a very host-restricted way. So they never, uh, never jump. So uh, if they jump, they don't survive. I don't know. That was helpful. Thank you. And and, and I would love to push push at the, the Wuhan story a little bit. You know, I've I've already done this in print, and maybe you've probably heard me talk about it. But for me, it's it's less an issue of, you know, in part it is the narrative and plotment. In part it is the Orientalism and the storytelling. But it's also evidence, and um, just thinking as a critical, you know, uh, historian of science or epidemiologist, one sees that the first three cases described in Wuhan were not associated with with the wet market. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, critical storytelling practices that is that is attentive to the archive in this case shows that, you know. If, if you're trying to identify a moment of emergence. And, and I think that is so difficult because of the ways, you know, now, now we know that it's, it's a very tiny fraction of the people who are infected with this virus 
that are um, showing up at the hospital with severe symptoms. A, an even smaller fraction are getting intubated. So the likelihood that even those three patients are the first, you know, uh, that I, I just don't think that that's very likely. So um, I, I would continue to push push against that that Wuhan story, the wet market story, may, maybe even the Wuhan story. Um, and just think about the spaces of the unknown and unknowability at this point. I, I think until we have, and this is something that Sasha and I are talking about, like more robust and diverse sampling practices that aren't aren't just sampling bats. I, I think you can think about the bats as, as a problem in, again, the history of science. Like someone gets an idea, this is a taxa where you might find viral diversity, they study that, those, those genomes are overrepresented in the databases. So it's, it's kind of an artifact of scientific memory practices rather than you know, clear genealogies and, and origin stories. So, so I wonder if in this paper, there's, there's a space for this unknown and unknowability at the current historical moment, also recognizing that by the time that this gets published, like that empirical basis that, that you're basing these claims on could, could radically shift. Um, as, as more, you know, basic empirical work is done. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. At the moment of right, at the, at the present moment, we don't know where, where the current virus did emerge from. Um, we try to address this in this latest version you have read in, well, also referring to your paper. We thought it is not our main point because this is a whole different, a whole discussion worth having, but um, our solution was to go to the original SARS-CoV-2 outbreak because there the evidence is clearer but not definite also. There are a lot of uncertainties and um, I think we often um, underestimate or overestimate what uh, natural scientists can find and um, if they have small sample sizes especially in the media discourse, it is always then something like it's proven that it comes from there or there. And in reality, we only have a small sample size and maybe this does not tell us very much. Exactly. But for us, oh, yeah, so close, please. Go on. Or, or I'd say maybe less the size of the sample, but sort of the breadth and the depth in terms of where the samples originate from. So it's less like the number of samples, but sort of where, where they are. Now, we, now we've got a bunch of, you know, COVID-19 you know, SARS-CoV-2 genomes, but it's yeah. just, a, as, as Sasha will tell you, it's a very tiny little fragment of, of, of species. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, but this is exactly what the issue was when we were starting to write. We were focusing on the Wuhan and then we were not finding that much literature. None of us reads Chinese uh, uh, on the, the wet uh, markets. And uh, so we, because there was so much uncertainty and also the discourse of, um, uh, that, that it might have jumped from that uh, Wuhan lab or like lots of conspiracy theories and, uh, and a lot of unknowns. So that's why we decided to, to talk about the, the first SARS and MERS uh, and uh, just say that at the time of writing, there are so many unknowns and still for the SARS, they, they, it's, it's very hard to pinpoint where actually this emergence was. But, but what, what you just said is this uh, to identify a moment of emergence and to, to maybe discuss, it would be interesting maybe to shift uh, the example then to, to, to Wuhan, if you so suggest, uh, and, and discuss maybe the uncertainties, because by now there is more data out than was when we started writing it. Um, um, maybe we can, we can do that. But it was really to try to circumvent that, um, that issue because there were so many unknowns, really. On, you, you have a question in the chat about Ted Bester's work in the uh, Tokyo market? Uh, yes. Thank you for a really fascinating paper. I'm looking forward to hearing updates uh, as we continue to explore uh, what's happening uh, with the market. I'm kind of really curious on two things. One is the uh, I was in another Zoom meeting. I learned that the term wet market I mean, as a Chinese native speaker, I had no idea 
of its exact translation. And I learned from another Zoom meeting that uh, it actually started in the Chinatown in San Francisco. Um, so I haven't had a chance to really explore the genealogy of that term, but um, I saw that in your paper, it's just translated as Tai Shi Chang, which really is kind of like farmer's market. <laughs> um, so I thought it was interesting. Uh, translational issue uh, and um, but when I was reading your paper I also thought of the Tsukichi market that um, Ted, Ted Baster um, uh, looked at um, I mean I, I've only taught her uh, his um, article on sushi and globalization in my globalization class and uh, I mean one of the most fascinating things from that um, piece, uh, Sushi Went Global, is of course um, how this uh, Japanese dish of sushi uh, it became a global phenomenon because of the rise of the U.S. economy after World War II. Um, so that's one example of um, globalization and entanglement of economic and cultural globalization. Uh, so I just wonder how you might engage with that uh, if um, if there are other ways we also think about the market uh, more broadly, uh, not just uh, uh, animal fish market, but also global marketplace. So thank you. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. I am familiar with uh, the work from Ted Bester, uh, but I think this would be outside of the purview as of the scope of this paper because we were really trying to engage with multi-species entanglements. Um, we, we did not only come to this multi-species entanglements uh, because of this paper, but also previously when I was trying to write my paper on how uh, the, the robotic devices are being used in the frame of, of care and how if we see a robot as a, some form of species and what does and, and what that means. So this is how we came to uh, multi-species ent ent entanglements and this is how we're trying to uh, discuss uh, the, the virus here in this paper, but uh, really trying to move away from uh, market fluxes, of, although of course this would be a very interesting uh, uh, point, but it would bring the paper in a totally different direction and we have a very strict word limitation, so I think we, we would not be able to discuss it at greater length, uh, lest it would be, uh, maybe uh, it would come across as, as just brushing the, the, the bare surface, but this is a very interesting point and I can uh, look into it because I am familiar with the work from uh, Ted Bester. I read uh, the Tsukiji market, so thank you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Eleni? Um, I mean, just to follow up on Fran's question, which I think is, I mean, it's, it's important because it brings in politics and that's the reading your paper, that's what I've been missing. I've been wondering what, uh, I mean, there's, there is a lot of politics like everywhere, but um, um, I mean, you situate yourself in the critical literature about the Anthropocene that goes against just treating the Anthropocene as um, caused by humanity um, in general. Um, you, you refer to the Marxist and to the post-colonial critique. Um, but then it's, that's kind of, that's missing in your discussion of your case study. Like, you don't analyze the, well, you don't analyze the market as a political space. That, that is shaped by local, but also by the global power dynamics that Fran just referred to. Um, but then also the politics of, and that's what Evan, what Evan referred to in his work, the politics of the, of the reporting about the, um, the market and Wuhan. Um, and I mean, maybe like there your disciplines can help you to kind of offer a perspective on the gene genealogy. Um, of this story and of the politics around it. But then, you know, also like the more broader, the more broader, like the politics in which you write this and the place from which you write this and the disciplines from which you write this, like what does it mean to write, to write about, to, to, to choose to write about this um, without having access to Chinese discussions and Chinese literature, questions like that. Um, but I would really like encourage you to, to take the politics a bit more serious because otherwise it's just another one of those Anthropocene papers from the global north. Um, and I mean, related to that, also like mm -hmm. I picked up quite a strong um, like Western bias in the <laughs> in the way you write about um, these examples of Africa and Southeast Asia, um, kind of 
right, you write about colonial situations, but you don't refer to colonialism. There's a strong bias between the wild, the wild and the natural and wild landscapes. At some point, you, you refer to African landscapes as wilder landscapes. And there, um, you, really, you really need to be careful to not, to not reproduce colonial ideas because wilderness itself is a colonial idea. A lot of these places you refer to are the result of a colonial history of displacement. Um, exotic animals, I mean, what are exotic animals? Exotic animals are animals that are local, local to somewhere, that somebody from another, another, another place um, defines as, as exotic, just stuff like that. There's a lot of politics in your paper um, that kind of like that just go unaddressed and that, that I think is are very important to address in a paper about the Anthropocene and about this topic. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I agree with you. The term wild landscapes and exotic is very problematic and we will have to rethink if we really want to use these terms or find other ones. Um, so thank you for that. Um, on the other hand, again, this is something Anne said before, this would take the whole paper in a whole di different direction and it wouldn't lead there where we wanted this paper to go. And I think uh, politics are very important, of course, and colonial politics as well. But if you make every paper we ever write about colonial and politics, we always have the same um, discussions. And I think in this paper, we want to have kind of a different discussion without uh, ignoring these kind of topics. So I think having a precise language and, and so on really helps. But um, this might really be a question of where you're coming from and where you're standing. Um, I personally do not like to engage in these politics if they're not my field of, of speciality. I think you can do a lot of things wrong there. But um, yeah, so that's my answer. Thank you uh, uh, for pointing out some of the terms you used, which are probably not perfect. I mean, but just by using the terms, you are part of the politics. I mean, there's no yeah. way of not engaging this, not engaging in this politics. By using the terms in a way you use it, you're reproducing a discourse. Sure. Yeah, as, as I said, um, I, I agree with you that um, using exotic animals and wilder landscapes both go into the wilderness debate and what is exotic and so on. I agree with you. We have to be more careful with these terms. But as I said, um, at least for me personally, um, having a di discussion about colonialism is not the point of this paper, even though you could make it the point if you wanted to. But again, um, you can't do everything in one paper. I always think, already think that our paper is a bit overloaded with very, very many ideas. Not all of them are thought out. So putting in more layers than even that, well, you are free to disagree. And maybe others will here disagree with me. But uh, at some point, you have to focus on something. But please um, disagree with me. So Sasha's got an interesting comment in, in the chat about um, uh, MERS COVID. So um, in part, I, I think it's important for us all to recognize that these are all the same species. And this is kind of some of the core work that, that Sasha is doing. But, but Sasha, do, do you want to tell us more about, um, so, so it sounds like there's multiple events back and forth that have been documented between humans and camels. Right, yeah, so yeah, so uh, SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2, uh, they belong to the same species, which is severe acute respiratory uh, related uh, uh, coronavirus. So there is another species which is called uh, Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory uh, uh, Syndrome uh, corona related uh, coronavirus, which include uh, many viruses and uh, including uh, MERS coronavirus, uh, which jumps uh, from camel uh, to humans. It is established, uh, unlike with SARS coronavirus, which we're still debating uh, original host. Uh, it's likely, but we don't know. But in this case, we know it is from camel. And, uh, and unlike with the SARS coronavirus, to, uh, this jumps happens almost every day. So this is a big difference. So it's people uh, outside uh, probably coronavirology don't appreciate as much 
this pack. But we have a hundreds genes uh, uh, which realized in the you know, human infection and sometimes in death. So uh, totally it's uh, probably a uh, number of people died close to 2000, yeah, so over the eight years. And they happen mostly from independent introduction of virus into human population. It's not something like what we observe now when it, it's uh, 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 spread from, from human to human. Uh, with MERS coronavirus, it's always jump from camel to human. Uh, and so then uh, maybe few people are the infected so few uh, died, but every case it's uh, almost it's a new case. So you have a statistic uh, there, and so it, because it happened in different parts of the country. So it's, it's mostly in Saudi Arabia, but also in, in some other uh, places, uh, and so in different families. So uh, so you, you have something that you don't have with SARS coronavirus, and you solve problem with ancestor, uh, and also it, it, it's some something about were intimate, intimate interaction between humans and camels, which is, of course, historically and culturally important. Mm -hmm. And a mystery, uh, why it happened in Saudi Arabia, but not uh, uh, around the world mostly, which is also an unresolved issue. Something, uh, something about this country. Yeah, so it, it might give your paper uh, against uh, something that it could benefit your, your study. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. We, yeah, we had a little bit more about MERS, but it flew out of, but, but because of the word count, but you're absolutely right. Uh, these are really good points. And I think, you know, the, the paper is also an opportunity, like everybody's writing on, on SARS-CoV-2 right now, and, uh, you know, more these other kinds of stories, I think, that emerge you know, that's super important. I, I wanted to, so, so Sasha has taught me two important things that I noticed in your paper um, in, in the recent weeks. For starters, um, it's, it's a matter of, of the specificity of, of um, how these viral genomes come together. So you use the word reassortment in talking about Celia Lowe's um, H1N1 influenza virus. Um, those viruses have chromosomes, so that's a different process than um, with the RN, so coronavirus is this, uh, this the uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a long RNA virus, so it doesn't have chromosomes, but it undergoes recombination. Um, so that's that's just a matter of terminology. But something that, that Sasha was pointing out in talks by genomic scientists at um, the uh, uh, Cold Spring Harbor Symposium is that many people are conflating the disease with the virus. So conflating COVID-19 with SARS-CoV-2. And, and I noticed in a couple of times in the paper, um, you're using, you're, you're talking about the disease. And it, there, there, is, there is that slipperiness, I think, in the primary literature within the biological sciences. And, and I see that same slippery, you know, it's, it's not, not to say that you're, you're making the same error that a lot of other people are making. And, and I think Sasha's really, um, important work is to point out that, that slippage between, because so, so many people get the virus and don't get any disease. And I think, you know, part, part of Sasha's project is to document that full diversity of, of these viral populations.